Has your sex life fallen to the same old dull routine? Then you need to try Like a Kitten's exciting sex box. You get to choose one item out of each of their six categories, toys, beauty products, lubes and cleansers, games, sexy accessories, and lingerie. Go to likeakitten.com slash holly or use code holly at checkout or click the link in the episode's description. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am so excited to bring you somebody who I haven't seen for such a long time. We used to shoot this amazing lady a lot. My mom actually used to shoot her quite a bit. So I'm so excited to see her again. And she looks incredible. And she's dressed up in like the most festive Christmas outfit, which I appreciate so much. So if you're listening to this on my audio channel, you should definitely go watch this on my YouTube channel because like you need to see how this woman is looking right now. I am talking about the only person who's ever been a Playboy Playmate and Penthouse Pet of the Year, the one and only Victoria Zadrock. Hi, Victoria. How are you? I'm really excited to see you. I know. It's been forever. We used to work together so much. Yeah, you were a baby too. <laughs> You're so young. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you, your mom shot the most beautiful photos of me. They're still my absolute favorite photos. Like I look at myself, I'm like, how amazing can this creature be? And it's all your mom's work. And you did some great work too. You guys worked together. She shot my pet of the year layout. Yeah. Yeah. No, we always had so much fun working with you. She says hello, by the way. Yeah, she was the best. She would climb up on the ladder and do all this other stuff that other photographers were too lazy to do. Yeah. Wait. She still does that. Even when taking like family pictures, she like has to stand on a chair. A chair. Yeah. She'd climb up the tall ladders and do all these overhead shots. I love overhead shots because I love true pinup. And the only way mm-hmm. you can get true pinup is sometimes is, is shooting down. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your story because you've had an unusual journey. So I think that we need to make sure everybody knows um, exactly, you know, where you come from and the path, your interesting path that you've taken. Yeah, I probably have one of the most unusual life stories uh, out there. So I came at 16 to the U.S. I was the first Ukrainian Soviet at that time exchange student. I was... um, awarded like a really rare all academic scholarship because I spoke English really well in other languages. So I came to Florida and I was supposed to be here just one year. And of course I immediately fell in love with the U S and I uh, said, well, you know what? I'm not going back. So I decided I'm going to get married. So I got married at 17 to my immigration attorney. And I moved to Philadelphia. <laughs> so That's one way to kill like two birds with one stone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I try, I I would go out on dates with guys my age and I was about, I was 17 and I would tell them, guess what? We can't waste any time. I need to get married. My visa's expiring. So you know how, how, how well that works with (laughs) year old guys. So, um, yeah. So then I'd, um, submitted my student, uh, papers to, to, uh, this lawyer I knew in Philadelphia, somebody recommended. And he said, uh, well, I can't really extend your visa. It's non-extendable but I can marry you. <laughs> I said, okay. So that was my, my first marriage. Uh, and it lasted about six years. And uh, he was a huge Playboy fan. So he had this huge Playboy collection, which I was incredibly jealous of because I was a very insecure Soviet girl at that time. I had bad acne and I didn't do my hair. I didn't do anything. So I was very, very jealous of all the centerfolds and uh, we would fight over it. And I'd be like, you know, I hate this collection. And one day he said to me, you know, you look just as good as all these women. I said, no, I don't. He goes, well, how about a bet? I'm just going to this. I, I At that time I was with Wilhelmina. He got a photographer, take some pictures and send it in. And I totally forgot. So time goes by. Meanwhile, I called his father and complained like your son has this Playboy penthouse collection. He's a pervert. So his dad who lived in the Amish community, came 
took all the magazines, including the rare Marilyn Monroe and all these autographs and burned them all. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I never have to, I never have to watch him look at these women that I'm, they just so unachievable. And so lo and behold, I get a Playboy uh, call and they're like, um, uh, you know, we'd like to fly you out for a test. And I completely forgot. So I flew out and they signed me up on the spot and he said to me, see, I told you so. I said, well, now the only issue you can look at is mine. So that was that. So I was became a playmate. I was the first Soviet playmate. And in my layout, there was a picture with Gorbachev shaking my hand. That was like a big deal at that time. <laughs> so, well, how did you meet Gorbachev? So I met him at the World's Affairs Council, but because I was the first uh, uh, first Soviet student to study in the United States, I was kind of a big deal. So I was a celebrity and I was supposed to go back and help with perestroika and glasnost. And instead I got married because I wanted to be an all American girl. So anyway, so then I um, post a playboy at that time I was in law school because I, I figured I would have a practice, um, like, uh, my husband at the time together, we, um, so I got my, uh, I was a bit of a genius. <laughs> so I got my um, bachelor's degree at 18. And at 18, I was already studying in law school. So at the time that I posed for Playboy, I was a first year law student. Wow. Then later on, I decided I didn't want to be a lawyer. And the reason I decided that is because I didn't know that my first husband was actually a mob attorney. He was actually, he represented John Stanfa, who was John Gotti's right-hand man in Philadelphia. So at one point, I just pick up the paper. I, th I think I'm like third year in law school, and it's all over the Philadelphia Inquirer, like John Stanfa arrested for ordering all these murders. So my first husband gets disbarred as part of this big bust on um, the mob. And so he goes from making a shitload of money to almost nothing. And at that point, our marriage <laughs> pretty much falls apart um, as he gets into gambling and everything else. So that was kind of the beginning of my life. I had no idea for a long time who he was. We would have dinner with this nice Italian people. <laughs> I had no clue who they were for the longest time. When I picked up Philadelphia Inquirer and it says, you know, his wife and his mistress are going to testify, whatever, are going to be called. Well, his wife couldn't. Spousal privilege. But anyway, so... Yeah, so it was uh, that was my first marriage, and then um, uh, I opened the site, very popular site, Planet Victoria, and I had that for a long time, and that's when I shot all these magazines. Uh, and at that time, Playboy ended up suing uh, Terry uh, Terry Wells, who had a successful site because they didn't want Playmates to use the word Playboy Playmate in the mad attacks. And mm -hmm. that case went to Supreme Court, and of course, the Supreme Court said, "Well, no." It's like NFL player or Miss Universe. Um, these women earn the titles. They're theirs to keep. They can use them in med attacks. So, um, but because of all of that, I had a falling out with Playboy and I ended up posing for Penthouse. So I became pet of the month, 2002, June, 2002. And then later on, 2004 pet of the year. So, wow. Yeah. Didn't I was, Hef yeah, didn't Heffler I was, like personally admonish you for, mm -hmm going over to penthouse. Yeah, I actually have a letter. I think I'm the only one. I have a letter that personally from Hefner in the States, uh, you were one of our best and brightest and we're so sorry to let you go. But I said, look, you decided to sue playmates and this is how we make our living. And it's not fair. We can't use the very title you gave to us in our meta tags. That was the only way people could find websites early on. Right, right. Falling out. And um, they were very restrictive as to what we could do. And I was already posing for like Leg Show and all these different other magazines. So I um, ended up switching to Penthouse. And um, so I had a really long, illustrious career starting from, I think I was a Playmate at 18. And then I was Pet of the Year at 30. And I kept modeling. So I, I think I probably, at one point, I was the most published nude model of all time. <laughs> like I would walk in. And all the magazines, everything from like gallery to club to hustler, everything you name it, you know, penthouse letters would all be my covers because I was such a workaholic. I would just shoot endlessly. You know, I would come out, shoot with you guys, everyone, basically, Steve Hicks, you know, all the top photographers. I don't think there's anybody I didn't shoot with. And I would shoot nonstop, too. I'm just I have a ton of energy. So I work and work and work. 
Did you have any bad experiences with any photographers while you were shooting magazines? And maybe like for those people who like don't understand what it was like to shoot just for magazines because that doesn't Mm -hmm. exist anymore. What was that like? Like what were those days like? You know, when you say bad experiences, I mean, (laughs) it's, I never had, believe it or not, I've never been sexually harassed by any nude photographers. That's the funny, any any photographers that shot nudity. The only photographer I was harassed was actually a fashion photographer because I was also doing catalogs and other stuff in New York. And um, I was supposed to test for some kind of catalog. And I remember I desperately wanted the job. So I put on a dress and it got stuck on my boobs and I couldn't get it off. So I was like, oh my God, I can't get the sample off of me. So I called the photographer and he was just kind of inappropriate. But um, but in terms of the nude photographers, the ones that shot nudity, they were all very, very professional. Um, but in terms of experiences, I think a lot of them are very critical. I my Well, I remember when I first shot for Playboy and he, uh, um, Richard Fegley shot me and he was old at that time. He was shooting for like, I don't know, 30 years and I just remember him being really bored and him saying, shooting a woman is like shooting furniture. There's only so many ways you can turn her. And I was like, okay, that's not very inspiring. But um, it wasn't a bad experience. Just, you know, and then, of course, I was shocked how they criticized the model right in front of her. They'll be like, oh, you know, her boobs are too droopy and, you know, her hair is too frizzy and uh, her waist needs to be taken in, bring a corset. So they're talking about you as if you're not really there. So the objectification at first was a little bit shocking, but you get used to it. You realize that they're looking for a product in the way it looks on the paper, obviously. So it, you can't internalize it. Yeah, before. but that's, yeah, that's, that's hard though. It's funny that you mentioned that because, you know, I was, you know, taught by my mother to really look for ways to say how things needed to be fixed without making it sound harsh because you're right. Like we're, we're looking to create this, you know, perfect fantasy image. Um, and you know, everybody's got, you know, creases in their ways. I won't even say fat rolls cause that's not what they are. Like when you turn in a certain position, but it's like, you don't want to be like cover your fat rolls. So, you know, you'd say things like, okay, like stretch up or like bring your arm up to hide the creases in the waist. Like there was just very specific like language and we kind of carefully danced around, you know, whatever it, whatever flaw we were trying to minimize. Um, you guys were but- amazing. I loved shooting with you because I shot with Earl Miller first and he was like, you need to lose 30 pounds. I'm like, I'm size four. If I lose 30 pounds, there'll be nothing left of me. But then he was at that time telling everybody to lose weight. I found out whether it was pertinent or not. And then Carl Walker tells me, oh, you'll never get in penthouse. You're just so over you. You're like overexposed. And, uh, you know, Bob doesn't even like playmates and you're not his type and you have cellulite on the back of your legs. So I run out and get all this stuff done, you know, and, uh, and then he goes, Oh, I, this is a terrible layout. It'll, it'll never make it. And then I get a phone call. Oh, you were scheduled to be Miss June. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of them are critical. I just remember crying many times going, Oh, I'm never going to be perfect. I need to fix this and I need to fix that. It, you know, those two photographers in particular um, <laughs> yeah. had a reputation for being really unkind to the models. And, you know, I've heard yeah. a lot of people tell me that made them cry, said stuff like that. Um, yeah. I think, I think, you know, I think Carl Walker told Jenna Jameson that she would never get into penthouse because of like her chin or something like that. And I think that's where <laughs> yeah. she got he it told me the same thing. Done. Well, he told me, Bob doesn't like playmates. There's no way you're going to get in. And I'm like, well, why are we even shooting that? Here. You know, why are we here? Well, I'm going to give it my best shot. But, uh, and then he puts these dead minks around my neck, right? <laughs> so in the centerfold, I'm wearing dead minks with, eye, with eyes. They're looking at me and I'm like, Jesus, like, this is horrible. Of course, I've got all this animal rights activist going crazy. Like she's wearing dead minks with faces around her neck, but he can't say anything to him. You know, he can't say, I really don't want these things around my neck. Was that the layout where like he had them, he, was it you that he took one of them and like attached it to your labia? It was like hanging down. Oh my God. (laughs) It was absolutely me. Yeah. I I don't know what, what, 
why, why, why Minx? Why, what does that have to do with being Russian? But I, they're around my, like, they're also like around my face. So you could kind of try to look at my face and you see these, uh, these beady eyes on both sides of these Minx. They're on my, they're everywhere. I'm like, you know, it's the skins. I don't know, I guess. But you know how you can't say anything. I figured, okay. And of all the pictures, that's the one that gets picked for my centerfold. I know. I remember that layout so distinctly because, you know, you're such an incredible model and such a beautiful woman. And I remember like we were pissed that like we didn't shoot your centerfold, yeah. like your original centerfold. And I remember looking at it being like, what the fuck is this shoot? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Imagine doing it. And this, the main smell, they smell like, you know, like taxidermy animals. Oh, so I'm god. Like, oh my God. On my fore, they're on my head. They're on my neck. They're around my, my hips. And you can't say anything to Carl. You know how thin skin he is. So yeah. I'm like, you know, and he'd be like, you know, like, so yeah, so that's the crazy part is he told me, oh, you'll never get in, you'll never get in. So then when um, they told me I'm pet of the year, which is like was poetic justice, because I was slated to be playmate of the year and it didn't work out. That's a whole other story. So um, it was a great, it felt like great revenge on Playboy, I have to admit. <laughs> See when, um, and I was 30 years old at the time, which is like really old, <laughs> you know, yeah. at the time I want that of the year. So, um, no, it was great. And I loved Bob. I got along really well with him. In April. Yeah. It's funny that you say that about like 30 being old, because I remember that. I remember those days when like being a 30 year old, you know, woman working in, in nude, you know, photography yeah. or a, an adult was like, insanely old. And now there's just like this whole MILF revolution where yeah. women in their thirties, forties, fifties are doing insanely well and have huge followings. And just like, yeah. I know a 78 year old model, you know, she's, and she looks amazing. I should actually have you interview her. Absolutely amazing. She's gorgeous. And she has tons and tons of followers. Yeah. So yeah, no, you- completely. The world has changed so much. Do you think that that has something to do with the fact that like the internet kind of allowed the audience to choose what they liked, you know, before when we were buying magazines, you know, watching TV shows, we were kind of fed, you know, whatever the media thought people wanted. And that was kind of your only option. But when the internet came along, you were able to seek out like what you really wanted. Do you think that is why? I think, yeah, I think consumers, it's all driven by consumer. Consumers choose who they want. And and most men do not want you know, 18 year old girls. They, that's the reality. They want a real woman. And I, uh, I feel a lot more, a lot of models I talk to who are my age, they're like, I feel so much sexier. I, I really wasn't really sexual or sexy when I first started in this industry. So yeah, I think consumers chose and I think, well, there were a lot of gatekeepers, these photographers who would tell the model like me, and you know, I was 30 years old. Yo, you never, you're too old. Well, you know, so, uh, yeah, so there are gatekeepers and, and the internet removed the gatekeepers. So now the audience, the customers choose what they want. So, so you are, um, an in- highly educated woman. Um, I know that you, you mentioned earlier that you were in law school, but you also have a master's and a PhD in psychology. Mm-hmm. So do you find that, that, do you ever find that that's like applicable to what you do now? I think especially like I don't know, having an OnlyFans account where you're interacting personally with, you know, a lot of your fans. Do you find that, that, that they're like those worlds mix somehow? Well, absolutely. I think, well, I have a PhD in psychology and then I have a postgrad in human sexual behavior actually. And uh, so it does help because you understand people's desires, fetishes, paraphilias better than anybody else. And you don't judge. It gives you an ability to understand and to open up your mind, that's what education does. It, it helps your mind to keep your mind open. So yeah, I um, so I have a PhD from Drexel in clinical psychology, and then I worked. Uh, so after I became head of the year, then um, you know when Mark Bell bought the magazine from from Bob Guccione, he made me. I replaced Xavier Hollander, uh, who wrote um, the um, Happy Hooker <laughs> and all this. Uh, it, Pen, as a penthouse advisor. So I started answering and I became penthouse editor. So I was their editor for six years. Uh, and I wrote, uh, so I edited like the letters and I wrote columns. And then I also did, uh, I, I had my radio show on Howard 100, uh, the sex connection with Jim Florentine. And I did the Fox news special correspondent. So it does help. It helps, you know, it helps to sort of 
understand the consumers and it, it helps to relate and not judge for sure. So, but yeah, right. I, I'm really enjoying OnlyFans because again, these are my old fans. I, I shut down Planet Victoria years ago uh, because, you know, I had family, I had kids and, and, you know, I'm recently divorced and I feel sexier than ever. So it was great to, to open up OnlyFans and to reconnect with some of my fans from, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, you also have written some books. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've written? So yeah, I've written, um, about four or five books. Some of them, um, were commissioned, um, and some of them like hers, it's the guide to a, a woman's pleasure was commissioned. Uh, Simon and Schuster commissioned me to write Dr. Zion scoring, which is a guide to, um, dating and picking up women. And then I have an enemy of pleasure, which is head to toe guide to better sex. So, and then of course I have the 30 day sex solutions, so a few, uh, but they all have to do with uh, love, sex and dating. So it's just kind of my expertise. Do you have any like gold pieces of advice to men about dating? I know that's a really broad topic, but is there like any one thing that you see that men do incorrectly? It's an interesting question. I always say in terms of dating in general, as a general advice, just remember it's a numbers game. That's what I tell people like, because people go on three dates and then they get discouraged and they say, everybody's a jerk. I said, it's a numbers game. You have to go through to find the right person takes, you have to, you have to meet a lot of people. That's just a reality. Like, just like you don't walk in if you want the dress that fits you, you don't put on two dresses and go, nothing fits me, right? You know how that is. You have to, so, so it's, it's a fit thing. It's all about the fit. So not to get frustrated, not to generalize, but that's sort of a general dating advice and to be patient in terms of men, what do they do wrong? They, um, they don't listen. Uh, I think the most important thing is to be a good listener, talk less, listen more, reflect her feelings. I think that's what women want. They want a guy that, that will listen. Yeah. I think one thing that I've, you know, seen a lot and, and, and heard a lot about is that, you know, men are fixers and I see this with my husband. Definitely. You know, I want to complain about something. I want to get something yeah. off my chest and he wants to offer me all these solutions and, you know, tell me what I should do to fix it. But like, I know what I need to do to fix it. Like I know what my path is. I just want to unburden myself. Exactly. That's what women want. They want empathic listening. They want their emotion reflected. Uh, you know, so if, if she comes home and says, you know, I, um, I really hate my boss. Uh, a guy wants to jump in and say, well, maybe you should change your job. Maybe, you know, we should complain to the superior, but sometimes all we want is to reflect the emotion. Say instead, if you'd say something like, you know, I realize this job has been really tough on you and you're doing a great job, or I realize you're, you know, you're very frustrated. It's not necessarily about problem solving right away, but it's about empathic understanding and reflecting the emotion. Acknowledge. Right. So along those same lines, what about sex advice? Um, you know, I have a lot of men who DM me, you know, asking if penis size is important. I know that a lot of men feel that they fall short in the bedroom. What what kind of advice would you give to guys like that who are insecure about their performance? So the first thing I always say, it's not about the size. It's about the fit between people. And that's why dating and sex is a numbers game, because some people just fit better together, right? Because every person's different in terms of their anatomy. And there's large individual differences and, and there's preferences. So the you can't predict the fit. So it's not about the size at all. For me, it doesn't matter whatsoever. Uh, it's, but it is about the fit with some people you just have, uh, anatomically better fit and, uh, chemistry. So, um, that's the most important thing. Do not get fixated. There's a lid for every pot. There's a lid for everyone's pot. So that's why the, the main thing is not to give up, not to get frustrated. And remember, like I said, it's, it's a numbers game. You have to meet a lot of people. Um, so, but in terms of the one piece of advice for men is to go slow. I think if there are, I hear complaints from women, both of the therapist and as a friend, and one of the biggest complaints is that men rush things. They rush foreplay. They rush kissing. Women love foreplay. It takes, there's a huge gap in terms of arousal um, between men and women. 
uh, female um, sexual desire is spontaneous. Female sexual desire is responsive to the environment. So like I always tell them, it's like Letterman said, you know, men are like fire. They're always ready. I mean, I'm sorry, men are like firemen. They're always ready. Women are like fire. It takes a bit to get them started. Then they'll burn with great intensity. So I think it's the patience and uh, slow down. I tell, I I always tell men to slow down sexually. They tend to rush things. You know what I mean? The touch has to be lighter, slower. Um, It's just, you have to to let her uh, feel the arousal. God, that's such a, I've, you know, of all the conversations that I've had with so many like sex therapists and, and other women on, on how to please a woman, that's like the number one thing is, is, is that men rush things and that women take a while. But I love your analogy, you know, about how women are like their sexual response is like environmental is like based kind of on like what's happening around them. It's not just like a a genital thing. And I find that to be so incredibly true. Yeah. Um, Um, I guess I always tell men, men are very visual. It's easy for their response. It's very kind of automatic, testosterone driven. Women are more complex because for us, sex is a full body and mind experience, right? Full body experience. And we're more, you know, our um, olfactory sense is, is much, much greater. So smell is important to us. Our audit, we're more auditory than just visual world. Um, so we have to, so it's, it's um, a lot more, uh, a lot more senses are involved for a woman to be aroused. It's not just so visual. Right. What do you think is the one thing that you would, you think that men need to understand about women? I think that one of the hardest things for men to understand is that, um, you know, we're just by nature more emotional and our brain is different. So it's not because we want to be more emotional, but women have a much thicker, um, corpus callosum, which is the part that connects the two hemispheres. So we can't compartmentalize like men do. Like men, men could, you know, once they're focused, say on sex or whatever it is, they can put everything else away, right? They're able to compartmentalize things and everything is in different compartments and to shut off. We can't do that because our, our hemispheres are more connected. Our brain is more interconnected. So if we have problems or issues, it's hard for us to just shut them down. Like we can't just forget about them. We have the revolving to-do list. We have all these things interfering sometimes with our arousal or our ability to connect in the moment. So sometimes we just need longer time to be able to switch. Uh, And we can't, you can't just, like I said, put things away in neat little boxes the way men do with different brain. Yeah. And also I think one of the other the other really important advice is that women love face-to-face conversations. We find we have oxytocin release, which is, it's a calming hormone. We like that face-to-face conversations. Well, that's something that most men and women need to understand is that men find face-to-face conversations that kind of tete tete confrontational a lot of times while women find them soothing. So when a woman wants to have a conversation like this, um, a lot of men kind of avoid that. So one of the best things to discuss thing is if you are um, side by side. So for men, side by side communication is more soothing. Face to face is kind of a confrontational thing because from an evolutionary perspective, the only time men would talk face to face usually is before the battle. So if you want to have a good conversation, important conversation, go for a walk and then talk uh, instead of that face to face sit down thing that women want to do. That is really solid piece of advice that I'm going to take home with me. That was, that was, I've never heard that before. And that totally makes so much sense to me. Yeah. So um, them, it's easier to talk if they're doing something. If you're like gardening together, if you're yeah. working, if whatever it is you're doing, and, but it's not, it's not confrontation with it side by side as opposed to face to face. Okay. From a psychological perspective, how do you think dating and relationships have changed in the last 10 years? Well, in some ways, I think it's harder to date because we have so many options now and they're so easily available, you know, right on the phone right there. So I think people are developing a bit of attach, um, a, a bit of attention deficit. I call it romantic attention deficit disorder, where it's sort of kind of, it's hard to focus on one person, right? It's like a shiny ball syndrome. Like there's so much going on at once that I think 
again, people give up easily and, and it's sort of hard to, to get depth because, you know, it's just too many distractions and it's just so easy, um, right now to meet new people that, um, uh, I think it's harder again to, to establish deeper connections for people. So that would be one thing. Uh, I think also that, um, accessibility of porn, it's has changed, especially male perception of what women want and what women are like. And that may be an issue, especially for new generation, as I see it, because, uh, men are exposed to porn at such young age. I mean, we're talking 10 year old boys who are looking this stuff up on their phones. And then you wonder what kind of perception they're going to have of women and what women want and what women are like and what dating is like. So one big social experiment. Yeah. I want to come back and talk more about that, but um, let's take a quick commercial break. And then we're going to come back. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, also what it's been like for Victoria. Uh, I know you've got kids raising children um, in the adult being an adult, um, model. Um, the fact that she's doing hardcore now for the first time on her only fans and so much more. So hang tight guys. We'll be right back. Going into a sex store can be overwhelming. You may spend hours browsing the shelves only to realize that you came home with stuff that you can't really use, or maybe you forgot like one crucial ingredient. This is why like a kitten is so amazing because they let you build your own box. So you can kind of choose your own adventure. You get to choose one item out of each of their six categories, toys, beauty products, lubes and cleansers, games, sexy accessories, and lingerie. What I love about this is that a portion of the proceeds go to charities that focus on women's empowerment, education, and health. So what are you waiting for? Go to likeakitten.com slash holly or use code holly at checkout for 20% off your box plus free shipping. That's likeakitten.com slash holly or use code Holly at checkout, or click the link in the episode's description. Hey guys, all right, we are back. Um, so Victoria, I just wanna know a little bit more about uh, your writing before we move on. Um, you write a lot about fantasies. Um, have you found that there's distinct differences between the fantasies that men have and the ones that women have? Absolutely. Well, in fact, I wasn't even the one who found. I, I read a study once and then it sort of confirmed my observations. So women tend to need um, certain ambience for their fantasies. So we have, when we fantasize, we tend to have a place, we tend to think of, um, like, we need to, cre we create a scene, a storyline. And in women's fantasies, they will talk about how they look. They'll say, oh, I looked great. I wore this really sexy dress and I was really tan. Men never talk about how they look. So men's fantasies are more about acts and parts. So there's sp about specific acts, whatever they are, right? Oral or, and specific body parts, breasts, but so they're, they're much more, um, again, compartmentalized kind of acts and parts for women. It, it's the whole storyline. It's the ambience. It's like I was walking on the beach and, and the water was so beautiful and there was a big moon and then the stranger appeared. So, you know, it gets, it, it they get just as explicit later, but they need a setup for the fantasy. Yeah, that's so true. Do you think that that's why they say that like, you know, feature porn movies, which has a whole storyline is, you know, porn for women. And then like the gonzo straight to the sex is like porn for men. Oh yeah, absolutely. I remember I met uh, Candida Real, who was, was amazing. And she was the first, she was a performer who then became, um, uh, you know, she became a producer and she produced what she called porn for women, for couples. And that was specifically what she did. She said, women need a reason why they don't want to, they want to know why these people are having sex. Men don't care. They just want them to have sex. So for, for women, it's always like, well, it has to be a firefighter who showed up or a handyman or a trainer or pool boy. There has to be a reason and a setup why these two are going to have sex, right? Men don't really care as long as, as long as sex is happening. They don't care why. Yeah. So we need the why. <laughs> so you made major headlines in 2016, um, when a audio of a conversation with you and Donald Trump came out, um, denying that you had gone on a date with him. What is your side of the story and how did it feel to be thrust into the political spotlight like that? Well, so first of all, I met the Donald back in 1996. And the way I met him is I got a phone call from Playboy Models, which was a separate entity that Playmates could work for. And 
at that time I was the, their Playboy uh, catalog contract girl. So I was on every catalog for like six months. So I guess he was getting my catalogs. Actually, it wasn't him who called his secretary and they said, you know, Donald would like to meet you. He is auditioning models for his uh, Casina campaign. And it's like $150,000 campaign. And uh, one of the lucky models will get to, later on, I found out there was no campaign. It was just a ruse he would use to, to meet women, of course. Uh, so it was for one of his Atlantic City supposedly campaigns. So I, so he sent me a limo. I lived in Philadelphia at that time. In fact, I was, I believe I was still married. It was, it was 1995, 96. So uh, I go, I go and, and I um, come out of the limo and there he is, the Donald standing. And he goes to me, do you believe how incredibly tall and handsome I am. I don't think cameras do me justice. And I'm kind of like, okay, I've never had any, anybody who starts a conversation like that. I go, well, I guess you are really tall in real life. But anyway, so let's just say we had the, the first dinner and I'm kind of being patient about that campaign and stuff. And the entire time he only talks about himself. So, um, and about all the women he's been in and about this and that and his ex-wives. And I'm like wondering, where is this whole campaign thing going to be discussed? So I sort of bring it up and he goes, well, I haven't decided yet. Uh, there is like this U.S. Open. Can you come to the U.S. Open? So I ended up coming to U.S. Open and I was in his booth and he told me, go out there and wave to all of my fans. And I'm going, well, maybe they're my fans. But anyway, so <laughs> I ended up going. And so I remember at the end of that, trying to convince me to come to some kind of party and to bring all these playmates. And I said, well... The way it works is we get paid to go to parties. You know, we don't just get up and go to parties because we want to go to parties. And he's like, no, no, no. There's, a, you know, my millionaire friends and I, we, you know, we don't pay anybody. I said, well, these girls are not going to get out of bed, get ready to go to a party. So anyway, so I met him for, I think, three or four days at this point. And at the last one, I brought it up. I said, look, what's the deal with the campaign? Because this is the whole thing. And he looks me straight in the, he looks me straight in the eye and he goes, honey. We use real runway models for that. So at that point, I was like, okay, what? This is bullshit. I'm not meeting anymore. So that was the end of it. And he left me a bunch of messages. So now, fast forward 2004. We fast, fast forwarding. And I kept running into him at the Playboy parties. I would just ignore him. So now, in so this was 1996. In 2004, when I became pet of the year, I did a story for Chauncey for Stepping Out magazine that was on the cover. And he asked me about different famous people I met or dated. And I talked about like Prince Albert and having sex with him. I was honest. I'm pretty honest and candid person. And I mentioned, you know, Donald. I said I never had sex with him because, you know, I didn't find him attractive and I didn't like him and just wasn't relevant. And he lied to me about the campaign. And I think he has a narcissistic personality disorder. So that was the end of it. So now Donald calls to do fact check. He calls, I mean, I'm sorry. No, uh, Chauncey, the, the journalist, calls Donald to do fact check. And apparently he audio taped the whole thing. So first he says, well, you know, we just interviewed this model. And she says, you have a narcissistic personality disorder. <laughs> of course, Donald freaks out. He goes, I don't have any, I don't even know who she is. I've never even met her. How could she diagnose me with narcissism? So it sort of devolved from there. And, uh, and of course, we have pictures together. So and he's like, oh, yeah, I, I guess I, I did meet her. So, you know, uh, so from there on, and, and then he's begging Chauncey not to publish this. He's like, I don't need this. This is not true. She's making this up. And I'm like, why would I make this up? This happened in 1996. There's pictures of us together. And like, there's no reason. And, and he knows he has a narcissistic personality disorder. At this point, I'm a PhD level clinical psychologist. And having met him in person, I have every capacity to diagnose him with that. Uh, I said, perhaps with only some sociopathic traits to throw in. So, of course, he did not like that. And then just went back and forth. And then he started making up that I was chasing him and I was the one calling him and all this kind of stuff. And of course, then I got really angry and said, all right, well, you want to know everything about our date and everything he said to me and everything he said about his ex-wives. So then, then of course the, the part of the clip um, where 
he's ranting and it's his usual rant. He's like, I don't, this girl, I would never go out. She's ugly. She's the ugliest playmate I've ever met. She's not my type. And why is she even in penthouse? And who would want a 30 year old pet of the year? And he's just going off and on. And he, she doesn't even look that attractive. And Chauncey has him in the corner. He's like, not only does she, she, she looks exactly like your type. In fact, she looks like a pretty younger Ivanka Trump. So, you know, he can't say anything. He's like, no, she doesn't. She's not even pretty. And I don't even know why they pick her for Playboy. And then she looks like a third grade hooker. So they just, it's like this huge rant that Chauncey published and Trump was really angry about that. So, yeah. So then of course, when he was running, this is now fast forward when he's running for presidency, I have all these reporters at my door and I'm li- literally hiding because by now I have kids and my, my daughters are saying to me, Oh my God, mom, there's reporters. They want to know what, where you are. And I, so I said, I have nothing to say at this point. I just did not want to get my kids involved in the whole controversy. So I declined. I said, whatever I said in 1996, whatever I said in 2004, feel free to reuse it. I have no further information to comment on that because I just did not want to be involved in the whole election mess there. So, so that was that. Never slept with him, but somehow all the websites on the internet says I was his girlfriend, which is ridiculous. Well, you know, the internet loves to just like the internet, if it's on the internet, it's true. It's, and everybody <laughs> who writes on things on the internet does all their research and does, you know, fact checking, and, you know, make sure that nobody ever publishes anything untrue on the internet. Man, all started, is- yeah. So it started with me diagnosing him with narcissistic personality disorder, which is literally in my PhD class. Uh, my professor said to, when he was discussing personality disorder, he said a classic case of it, which should be right in the, t- the textbook case, is Donald Trump. This was way before he was president. I said I didn't say that. It was literally our professor that brought it up. So that's how so it started. You, I'm just curious because you said that Donald knows that he has narcissistic personality disorder. Do, wouldn't people who have narcissistic personality disorder like not recognize? That not that part of being narcissistic is the inability to be self-aware? Well, to a certain extent. I mean, I think he, he, he knows by now, as I'm sure it's been brought up to him, and I don't think he cares. The truth is that narcissists don't really care if you call them narcissists. They just mm. want audience and attention at all costs, right? That they, have, they want the spotlight. They want to be the center of the spotlight and attention, and we all know that he does. So um, I think on some level he does. I think he just, at that point, he didn't like some some centerfold pointing it out perhaps, you know, so he figured he'll just say, I never, I don't know who she is. He had no idea that, you know, yeah. that would just make him look like a liar. That's so. crazy. So you have kids, um, and you know, I've interviewed a lot of women who work in the adult industry, who have children, who have either given advice on how to tell their kids about their job or are concerned about how they're going to talk to their kids about, um, what they do for a living. I know that, I know that you're doing hardcore porn on your OnlyFans only now. So you have, you know, the stuff that's out there of you is, is probably a lot tamer than some other people that I've spoken to, but, um, how did you manage that? And you have a daughter who I think is, is modeling now. How do you talk mm-hmm. to her just about modeling in general, like glamour modeling? Cause you spoke earlier about, you know, photographers being really critical and really like unkind. Like, how do you, how did you set up your daughter to kind of deal with that? Well, my kids were actually modeling at a very young age. Like Silvana was with Ford, um, since two years old and she was, um, she was like a Neiman Marcus. I have so much of her modeling work, Neiman Marcus books. She's actually worked a lot as a little, little girl. Mm-hmm. And then later on, Ford closed their a kids division. So I switched her later to Wilmina. And my other daughter uh, wor- worked also from young age. In fact, when she was seven, she was the face of young Versace. So they both worked. Um, it's funny because with my older one, I gave up. Um, because she was very like sensitive to textures. And I remember we went to this Ralph Lauren audition and uh, they made her put the skirt and it was a sample, you know, it wasn't lined. And, and she, she just had this huge meltdown. She's like, I hate this stupid skirt. And I said, you know what, let's just leave. She was crying. She was itchy. So, um, so I gave up with them for a while. Um, and especially when, after my son was born. So they were, they were in the industry from the time they were two or three years old. So 
they they knew. I remember my um, my uh, yeah, that's my second daughter. She did a thing for Nickelodeon where they made these kids. They said we need high energy kids. She was high energy. They literally kept them jumping up and down for ten hours straight. And she was complaining to me. She says, mommy, I don't know, they're five or six years old. I want a break. They're like, no, we need these kids dancing for six hours straight. They're going to be dancing. That's why we specifically warned the parents that these have to be high energy kids. So I think they were used, they, they knew about how callous the industry is. I mean, they, they felt it firsthand. Like the designers not caring that the products are not lined and that the, you know, that there was pins prickling the kids. The fact that they just want the final product. It's exploitative like that by its design, right? So they were familiar with that. And then later on, um, uh, my older one modeled more. Um, she, uh, you know, at some point, the, they, this whole thing of Playboy Penthouse came up. And the funny part, I was always worried. I thought that it would be such a big deal that they would be so scared. But somehow it was like a non-event. I just remember a bunch of her friends wearing like Playboy memorabilia and her saying, Oh, you guys just, you wear, you know, it's so popular now the, the shirts with the bunnies and stuff. They were like, you wear all that stuff. My mom actually was in the magazine. And they were like, Oh, okay. Like it wasn't, it didn't seem to be like a big deal. Now later, uh, when, um, it, it was already in late high school is, is when I think it was harder on her because that's when the boys were looking up harder stuff. And that's, at some point they were, I think, assuming there was some assumption that, well, you know, her, her, her mom is, you know, loves sex. So she must love sex too. So she's had a bit of a hard time in, in late high school, I would say the last two years of high school with that. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, I think it's just made her develop tougher, thicker skin. Cause I told yeah. her, look, you know, and then she would say, look, I don't care what you say. So my mom, you know, was a nude model or adult star and, and your mom is fat and ugly and stupid. And my mother's a doctor. So she, I think she learned to be defend, you know, she learned to be offensive to, to not be so defensive about it. Mm-hmm. What advice gentle, would you, gentle. yeah. What advice would you give other mothers working in the industry about how to handle that subject with their kids? You know, that's a really tough one because again, all the kids are different and all the familial circumstances are different. It all depends on, you know, the fathers, the, the, all the other caretakers that are involved, obviously, and where they are with it. I mean, I grew up in a very liberal family and I grew up as an atheist. So there was never any Catholic shilt, shame and guilt. There was never anything. And so I mean, and I'm, I'm in general, very kind of less affair mom. So for me, it was easy because, you know, I, I never really hit it. It was sort of in plain sight. Um, like the covers, the conversations, and, and I'm very open about sex. So, so for me, it was sort of a natural transition. But again, it's hard. It's not something that is easily, like I said, every family is different. Some, some family want to protect their, um, their children longer than I did from the information. Um, to me, I think being candid and being comfortable in your own skin when you talk about it, um, you know, is, is the way to be. And it, it's not just about adult industry. It's, it's the comfort with sex. It's a natural human function. Uh, we should all talk about, you know, openly and honestly. And in fact, like with me, my teen girls, they'll come to me and they'll talk about anything regarding to sex, you know, anything regarding sex in general, not just adults. And all their friends will come in and they'll ask me. I had at one point all these girls asking me to run out and get them plan B. You know, I was like the one showing up, getting them plan B. and. Uh, so, you know, I just remember that Silvana's one of her friends said, you know, if I had your mom and how open-minded she is, all my problems would go away. So I think that it's, it's a broad conversation about the fact that sex is normal and natural. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It, the, the guilt is a societally, um, say, you know, imposed and created. So it's, it's, it's just being open about, about our sexuality in general. Do you find that the stigma from the adult industry affects you in your personal life in any way? Well, like I said, I've reached a state of shamelessness a long time ago, so I personally don't allow it to be internalized. Uh, but, but of course, there's always going to be people who are, are going to judge you. I think the biggest issue it comes up is with, um, 
uh, is when if you're divorced and dating and you're dating someone with children, that's where the issue comes up because the ex-wife of that person is very very easily could, could manipulate it against that person and say, you know, you're dating a porn star and I don't want my children around porn, porn stars. So that's where it comes up a lot. Um, personally, though, I, I don't allow it to, to affect me. I've always worked for myself. I've always been a free thinker. Uh, so, and whenever the issue came up, uh, it came up when I was getting my PhD and I said, well, if this issue comes up again, they were mentioning the fact that I had a paid nude website and I was getting my PhD and that, uh, the patients would be damaged. The patients I counsel at the time were homeless unemployed veterans. I said, if you can prove that a homeless unemployed veteran can pay $25 to join my nude site and then would be damaged by seeing their therapist, then we were going to have some kind of discussion, but till you can do that. So I, you know, I don't allow it to get to me, but I know most people are more fragile and they, in, in the adult industry is not for the fragile people. There's going to be stigma. There's going to be judgment. It's for people who, who have to learn not to care what others think. Mm. Yeah, that's so incredibly true. You know, um, I always say the adult industry isn't for everybody, but for the right people, it can be, you know, the perfect career choice. Do you feel that it's been the right career choice for you? You know, I, I feel like it's been incredibly empowering to me and I've never regretted it. People would say, you know, you've ruined your career as a lawyer, whatever you, you're going to regret posing. But I've never regretted the path I took. Uh, I feel like in many ways it's been like in, in, inspirational for other women. It's been empowering. And, 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 and people say, well, it's, it's kind of po- almost post feminist where we don't need feminism. We, we, um, women could make their own choices, their own decisions, and they don't have to be constrained by societal judgment who they should be or can be. So yeah, for me, it was a right choice. I, I love uh, sex education. I love, um, everything related to love, sex and dating. So it's sort of a natural, natural, um, tie in for me. I've never regretted it. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about your OnlyFans. <laughs> yeah, I started it during pandemic because my practice declined and there was just so much free time and everybody was talking about it. So it was a good time to start for sure. Plus, I was excited to have a platform because, like I said, I had Planet Victoria and it was a very successful site for many years. But the problem, the uploads were difficult. The There were a lot of issues associated with running your own website. So I like the fact that there was a platform which, uh, which had, you know, certain, uh, rules and regulations and that made it easy to interact with fans like that. What has been, um, your experience interacting with your fans? You found that a lot of them are like your original fans from the beginning. Um, have you acquired, have a lot of new ones discovered you? Like what is your fan base mostly like? So I have, I have a lot of loyal fans. Some of them, in fact, that have every single picture I've ever had. That some of them pictures I never even seen because I would shoot and not bother to look at the content. So I have some of the old loyal fans, and and I have a lot of new ones. Like you said, milfs are very popular right now. So I have a lot of young young men who are um, who are joining as well. So it's it's a com- combination. And you're shooting hardcore for the first time. Um, yeah, I'm so-, sure so many people are excited about. So tell us a little <laughs> bit about that. They try to talk me into it. I remember I shot um, Michael with Michael Nin. I did his Temptation video, which is, was kind of groundbreaking at that time because that was um, hardcore, but girl, girl, hardcore with my friend Lynn Thomas. And he tried to talk me into bike, boy, girl, hardcore. And I said, well, it's a slippery slope, but I'm not sure I want to I want to get on that slippery slope. And then, of course, you know, I got busy with the kids and life and, um, and my other career. Um, so, yeah, it was <laughs> – I decided – well, Brittany Andrews is the one who talked me into it. She said, you know, it's time, Victoria, it's time. I said, all right. <laughs> so I went out and I stayed with her and she said, I'm going to get you the hottest male porn star. And he really was great. Um, you're going to enjoy it. And uh, we're going to do it. It's going to, so we did a great job. She was the producer on it. It's a, uh, it's um, four girls and one guy. And apparently got can nominated. I ask, my, yeah. Mm-hmm. Can I ask you, who's the guy? Yeah. Johnny Sins. Oh, it was jo- oh. Yeah. He's amazing. Oh my God. Johnny Sins is incredible. Yeah. He is probably one of the best in terms of he, 
he does, you know what it is? He, he manages somehow to create romance on the set, which is really amazing. And I think what every woman wants, it's like the whole, the compliments, the touch. He definitely has a, he definitely has a charm factor that I could see why many women fall for him. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, the, the, um, uh, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. I have to admit. <laughs> yes. Um, so it was, we shot a lot of it at Brittany's house, Brittany Andrews house in Las Vegas. She was the producer and it's, um, I said four girls and one guy. And she just told me recently got nominated for some AVN awards. So it should be interesting. Fantastic. Well, congratulations on the award nomination. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, Victoria, thank you so much for coming on. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you. Um, we're actually going to do a special bonus Q and a for my Patreon members only. So if you guys are a member of my Patreon, you'll be able to check that out. But, um, for here, we're going to close this out. So Victoria, can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Go ahead and plug sure, all so your plugs. You, yes. Yeah, so if you want to find me on Instagram, it's at legendary playmate. Uh, and then because somehow Victoria's drug was taken in every variation of that. So I ended up getting legendary playmate and, uh, the only fans, it's only fans, Victoria's the drug. And for those who <laughs> still have trouble with my, um, uh, last name, it's Z D R O K Th- three consonants in a row. You have to remember because you're going to have desire to stick a vowel in there. No, it's Z D R O K. <laughs> so like, the doctor in it, D-R-O-K. So Z-D-R-O-K. So uh, of OnlyFans, I have Unlocked, for those who prefer that platform. And I have Twitter as well. So, But yeah, the, it's all tied in on um, the Instagram, which I restarted, Legendary Playmate. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. Don't forget to follow me on TikTok. I have a TikTok, um, Holly Randall Unfiltered. I also have an OnlyFans, onlyfans.com slash Holly Randall. And of course, if you want to support this podcast and listen to this bonus Q&A that we're about to do, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Have an incredible holiday season and um victoria thank you for dressing up so festively you look amazing and i'll be a little out for you guys (laughs) you definitely have put us all in the spirit happy holidays guys see you next week going into a sex store can be overwhelming you may spend hours browsing the shelves only to realize that you came home with stuff that you can't really use. Or maybe you forgot like one crucial ingredient. This is why Like a Kitten is so amazing because they let you build your own box so you can kind of choose your own adventure. You get to choose one item out of each of their six categories, toys, beauty products, lubes and cleansers, games, sexy accessories, and lingerie. Go to likeakitten.com slash holly or use code Holly at checkout, or click the link in the episode's description.